Well, welcome today's, to today's uh, Cabinet Learning Series. Uh, as Jean mentioned, I'm going to be covering some of the uh, new parts of Cabinet Safe 10.3, and then I'll be going over our new uh, e-sign and uh, going through some demos on that and showing you how you can put it into work in your organization. The first thing you're going to notice in the new Cabinet 10.3 is preview. Uh, we've expanded the number of options that we support for previewing documents to where now we have four different methods. The first one is paging. This is ideal for situations where you have a low amount of bandwidth and you want to only uh, download one, uh, uh, one page at a time into your preview versus the entire document. The other three methods will download the entire document. And each of these have their own little subtle uh, pros and cons, if you will. Um, if you're not using paging, you're probably going to be using the auto method, which is going to use the built-in software uh, to preview those uh, documents. It will identify what kind of document it is and preview it. There's going to be some document types that uh, it, it will not preview. And in that case, it goes into the uh, Windows mode, where it'll look at your local machine and see what software you have there that might be suitable for previewing that document. And if it's available, it will preview the document. The fourth method is the browser mode, where it's um, treating uh, things in a browser interface, great for viewing HTML files and uh, uh, seeing what's in the, the contents of a uh, zip file. By and large, you're not even going to notice any difference. This is going to sort of automatically happen for you. And the reason for that is we've uh, taken a lot of time to preset the default configurations to where we've got it optimized to where you know most things are going to preview without you doing anything. Uh, but if you want to uh, tweak it and, and experiment with it a little bit, on a per user basis, you're able to go under Options, Document Display, and then you'll see a list of the different file types and what mode of preview is, is currently set for that. If you want to make any changes, you just click Edit and then change it to the uh, preferred method of uh, preview. If you get it all uh, changed around and you can't remember exactly where you were, we also offer a reset method. Now, this is going to uh, uh, affect all documents that are previewed for that type. If you want to kind of experiment on an individual basis uh, in your preview, uh, we also include a pull down where you can temporarily change the preview mode uh, between the four different methods for that particular document that you're looking at. As soon as you leave that document, um, it'll go back to the uh, uh, natural default that's uh, been set through your uh, options. Alternatively, if you like a preview and you, and you determine that, hey, wait a minute, this, this looks a little better on my machine because I have this particular version of software of uh, Office installed, I want to change the uh, mode, uh, you can use the gear. And what that will do is it's the same effect as coming over under options and changing it as a, as a permanent uh, default. But you're able to do that while you're looking at the individual document. So I suggest you know take a look at it, experiment a little bit. And uh, if there's a method that works better on your machine than in other ones, go ahead and set that as your default. Otherwise, more than likely, you're going to be fine just using the, uh, uh, the, the system uh, defaults. The next thing we did was we expanded our password policies. Uh, you know, more and more every day in the news, we're hearing about uh, different um, uh, security breaches. And there's always pressure to stay one ahead, one step ahead of everyone. And what we've done is we've expanded the uh, policies that the administrator can enforce for all of the users. And what, what they can do with that is they can specify the length of the password, the minimum length of the password, uh, what, what re is required in terms of uppercase, lowercase, uh, including numbers or special characters. And what over, these numbers to the right of each of these indicate is what the uh, uh, allowable entries are. So in other words, I could have a minimum length of up to 24 characters. Uh, absolute smallest requirement is, is one character. Uh, and then I can enforce uppercase of at least uh, 0 to uh, 3. We also have the ability to determine how often can you reuse a password. A lot of times people might only have two passwords and they just change it from one to the other. Well, that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, set the, the bar high enough for what a corporation wants. So we've uh, incorporated the ability to control up to 24 months of someone being able to reuse a pre-used 
password. Uh, the other things are, are were already in the system, but they're also part of the whole package of uh, password policy in that we can uh, enforce a expiration date, which forces the user to uh, reset their password. Uh, also, we can control the uh, login policy, how many attempts are they trying to log in before they get blocked and those type of things, as well as uh, resetting the security challenge to where if someone wants to reset their password, let's say they forgot it, uh, then we can present um, one of three different challenges for them to answer uh, that they had previously set up uh, in the event that they get challenged. Those, those last three were already incorporated into the system, but they are part of the overall password policy. If a user is trying to change their password and for some reason it's not accepting it, we, we have a policy information button all they need to do is click on that and it spells out exactly what's required uh, for that password that they're trying to create. So maybe they forgot to put a number on it or something like that. It would say what the minimum requirements are for that uh, particular password. Next thing we did was we allow the uh, uh, user to copy folder indexes only. And where this comes into play is um, oftentimes a, someone will, will have a cabinet set up to where uh, Folders are essentially the same. Maybe only one item is different between one folder to the other. For example, uh, if I have a, a, a service business where I calculate, the, I, I, I mean, I catalog things as a, uh, as a job, and I might have several jobs for the same customer. So all the other indexes are identical. The only thing that's changing is the job number. So what you can do now is you can um, uh, go to the uh, uh, folder you want to do, uh, copy, right click on it, select copy folder and it will present all the indexes that are currently set for that folder. It will not fill in the uh, uh, unique ID. That still needs to be uh, either automatically generated by the system as it is in this example or typed in by the user. And then the user is also able to edit any entry. So let's say I'm copying this particular job and I'm going to give it a new job number as a new folder. I can just enter the new job number and create a folder. So it makes it very easy to accurately uh, create a uh, near perfect copy of the uh, folder that uh, uh, you wish to copy. Saves a lot of time in entering uh, data and also eliminates mistakes of uh, entering in numbers that, that could have been just copied from another folder. Filer has four new options and I'm going to go over those individually. Uh, the first one is Use Outlook file name for document title and filer. So uh, the, the previous versions, we had the ability to sort of extract data from the email and apply that in different ways to the title. So it might have been the uh, who it was to or who it was from or the date and that type of information was, was applied to the title. Well, as, as things evolve, there's, there's certain implementations of Outlook and Exchange now where uh, they prohibit, prohibit software from extracting that data from the emails, and thus we're making them impossible for us to file in the system. Um, so now what we do is, is there an option to where in those situations where that's not possible, you can just use the file name of the message and use that as the title when you drag and drop it into SAFE. The next two options kind of work together, and uh, this, this kind of goes along the lines of you know, trying to keep it as simple as possible for the user. Uh, a lot of times people will drag and drop documents into SAFE as their primary method of bringing them in, and they want to use the existing title of the document as the title in SAFE, so there really isn't any template manipulation that they need to be concerned with. They just need to drag it and, and have it uh, file into SAFE very quickly. So the, the first method allows them to do that uh, by turning that on. When they drag and drop something into a uh, folder, uh, what we call quick filer will pop up, and they have the option of filing and routing that item or just simply filing it. Uh, the next option also allows them to pick a tab. So if I drag and drop an item over a open folder on a particular tab, it'll automatically pick up that tab assignment and file the document. But let's say I don't have the folder open and I want to drop it right on an unopened folder uh, by having the, the, the quick file or tab select uh, enabled, I can select what tab I want to put it into that folder. Now, 
quick filer is, is, is a great option to help speed things up, but it isn't necessarily always the best option. There's going to be those cases where you need to uh, be a little more granular in how you specify and where you do, uh, file the document and maybe you want to change sensitivity or some other parameter of that document. You can always get to the original filer by clicking on the advance button. What that's going to do is kind of shift modes for you, put you into the original full filer uh, method to where you have control over all the parameters as you currently have today. This is just a feature to, to make things easier and quicker in most cases without uh, removing the ability to have um, uh, better control. Speaking of that, the uh, next thing that uh, we have for filer is automatically attaching an item to another item that you drag and drop it over. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. People have tried to do this and, and then they discover that it doesn't work and kind of wonder, well, you know, boy, that would be nice to have. And we heard that from a lot of different people, so we went ahead and implemented it. And the way it works is when, when you have it turned on in your options, whenever I take an item and drag it over an existing item in a folder, it will automatically uh, attach itself as a child to that particular document. Uh, for cases where you want it to be filed as a parent, there's a couple of methods of, of doing that. You can drag and drop it into a white space of a folder, but sometimes folders are so full that you know the, the list is actually longer than the space that's in there, so there is no white space to drop it in. In those instances, all you need to do is drop it on the appropriate tab and it'll automatically file it as a parent under that uh, particular tab. So again, you know, these filer options are just trying to make things a little more simple and a little more efficient when you're using SAFE. Search is the next area of, of, of change. Uh, up until now, whenever I performed a search, it would open up a uh, independent or separate window. And oftentimes, that's real helpful. If I've got multiple monitors, I can put it on a different monitor. But what we're, people were looking for is, is how can I keep that all contained within SAFE? So what we've done is we've taken that window and moved it as an option to where you can have it as a separate tab in SAFE. So now when I uh, click on search, it's going to open up a tab, and I'm going to perform the same functions right within SAFE. Uh, this is one of those real subtle changes to where you don't even feel it operating differently. Uh, oftentimes people would, uh, with some of the beta testing of this, they would start using this and, and not even realize they were using this feature. It, it just comes that natural. But it does give you the flexibility of, of flipping from search into a cabinet or to your dashboard uh, directly uh, within SAFE without having to go over to a different uh, window. Share is the next area that we made some uh, improvements. A um, little bit of a subtle improvement here, but it is one that uh, gives you a little more information about uh, what's going on in, in your use of Share. In 10.2, we had a status column. And uh, it was very useful in being able to tell, OK, something has been sent out. It's new, which means whoever the intended recipient is has not uh, uh, downloaded or, or, or viewed that document. As soon as they access it, the status changes to accessed. So then you know at least that they, they had an opportunity to, to, to click on it and, and, and look at it. Uh, we've had a number of requests to expand that information a little bit. So what we did was we renamed the column as accessed. When an item is first shipped out, it, the accessed is showing as new, which means it has not been accessed. And then when it is accessed, we actually go ahead and uh, date timestamp uh, that action so that um, the, the, the safe user knows exactly when that uh, item was accessed as opposed to just being accessed. We also incorporated that same capability in the portal to where now the status goes from new to accessed and it shows the uh, a new column that has a uh, when it was accessed. Again, just giving a little more information to the users as to the accuracy of when uh, actions are being taken place uh, from uh, uh, various portal users. Next, I'm going to talk about eSign. Um, eSign is, is, is kind of the, the second release of our eSign, and we've made some significant uh, changes. Uh, there was a lot of feedback on some of the uh, uh, concerns of the initial release, and um, uh, we've, we've kind of taken a step back and uh, uh, reinvented the whole eSign uh, 
capability. So let me kind of go over where we are today and, and what we can do. And those who are using the old version of eSign will see the differences. Uh, but I'll talk about this as being a, a fresh new eSign. First of all, it's a low monthly cost. It's $25 per month per, per user. Uh, and that comes with a 12-month uh, uh, commitment, but the payment is on a uh, monthly basis. There's no minimum number of users. Uh, so if your organization has 50 people, but only three people are going to be responsible for sending out items for signature, then you would only need to, to sign up three users. Uh, it supports multiple documents in a package. Uh, this is very useful if um, you have uh, uh, several items that need to be signed and they're on different uh, uh, documents. Or if you have accompanying documents, uh, maybe an appendix that doesn't require a signature, all of those can be included in the package. We also give you control over the signing order. So if there's a, uh, a, a signing ceremony that needs to take place where, let's say, a manager needs to sign something first, and then the vice president, and then the president, you can control the order that that item is uh, being signed. Otherwise, it'll be sent to all of them at the same time, and, and the system aggregates all of those signatures in the final document. And you can also control the document order. So if I have a, uh, an agreement and, and there's two appendixes, I want to make sure those, those show up at the end of the agreement and in the proper order, and you're able to uh, control that. Finally, there, there's two modes of operation. Uh, one is using a prepared document where the signature fields are already assigned. And uh, just the creation of that document inherently uh, 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 includes those signature fields, such as a, a, a PDF form, uh, or an ad hoc signature assignment where, let's say I have a, a PDF that doesn't have any signatures on it, or a Word document that um, uh, I want to have signed uh, on an ad hoc basis, we'll be able to assign those signatures to that document as you send it into uh, eSign. And I'll go over that in my demo. Speaking of demo, let me shift modes here. I'm going to pull up uh, Safe, and and um, let's go into the uh, uh, Globex Corporation. I have some folder indexes over here, so I'm going to open the folder and create a new document. And what you can do is you can have documents that are common to the company uh, that that you know are are built into a template, and um, I can you know generate them with the intent of sending it out into uh, eSign. So a good example here is a uh, eSign demo that's kind of based off of a uh, non-disclosure agreement. I click OK. And this is just using our standard built-in PDF forms where I have a, a constant that's going to automatically fill in the date that I create the document. Um, uh, this is going to be between cabinet. And since I'm in the Globex Corporation folder, we pre-populated that information from the uh, folder indexes, as well as picking up the address uh, and, and any other information you want to pick up from a folder index. At this point, if I had other fields that I needed to enter, I could manually enter in that uh, information. But you'll notice that I already have a signature field, and I have the, the name and the date. Uh, eSign is going to capture the signature and also populate the name of who's signing the document and the day that they uh, signed the document uh, as part of the whole uh, process. So let me go ahead and close that. And to, to send something out for signature, all you need to do is right click on it and go down to the new menu item called uh, eSign Send. You click on that, it's going to review the document. If I have other documents, I can add them into this panel here. But I'm just going to show this with the one right now. Loads up eSign. And at this point, it's going to walk you through the whole process. Uh, there's certain system defaults. For example, the package name is given a default of important, because usually when you send something out, you want it to be important. But you can, um, you know, uh, Call it anything that you want to uh, call it. Same thing with the message. Uh, the default message is, you know, please review and sign, and you can change that any way you want. Click Next. Um, the next process is to designate who's going to be signing this document. Uh, if you remember, when I created that document, there were two signatures in that document. One of them was for the company that I'm sending it to, and the other one was for Cabinet. So let's go ahead and assign those. I can double-click on them 
it'll pull up my list of uh, people that I want to uh, sign. Uh, if, if the person you're sending it to isn't in the list, you can add them as a new one. Uh, if there's someone that's you know no longer that you're dealing business with or whatever, you can remove them from the list. So the, the user can control their own uh, list here. So in this case, I'm going to send it to Sally. Double click and it, it selects that. Um, and then I'm going to send this one to uh, Tom. I can either double click and it automatically selects it or I can click assign and it will assign it. The next thing I can do, I mentioned controlling the order. This is where I would do it. I would click this button to enable signing order and when I do that it uh, turns on the arrows and I can move names up and down into whatever order I want. Uh, otherwise if this is unchecked it's going to go to uh, uh, all signers at the same time. The other box down here I have is to enable workflow. And what that does is after an item has gone through the signing process and is checked back into SAFE, uh, it will automatically be put into workflow based on what uh, workflow criteria I define when I send it into eSign. So here's where I'm going to send it uh, in, into, uh, just send it to myself. And this is the message that would be in the workflow note as it went into workflow. I can click next. Uh, actually, as, as when a package is ready to be sent, uh, the send becomes enabled. I could actually send it right now. But if I click next, it gives me a summary of everything that I've entered in so far. So here I can see the title of the document, who I have designated as signing it. Um, if, if the ordering is, is uh, enforced, it will show the proper order, what the message is, what the uh, name of the uh, package is, and the note that I have going into workflow. All you have to do is click send, and the system will give you confirmation that the package was sent for a uh, signature. If we go look at it in safe, you can see that the item now appears as being checked out. I can right click and do a trace, and uh, the trace is going to tell me that it was checked out by eSign, and here's the uh, package name that I put in there. Here's the message in the uh, package. And it also tells me who all I sent it to. I sent it to Sally and I sent it to Tom. So let, let's change our hat a little bit. Let's pretend that we're Sally and Tom and go through the process of what they would see as being a signer for a document in eSign. So I've got some uh, Gmail account going on here. The uh, uh, user will get an email notification from eSign Live. That's the service that we use. Uh, they, they, they click on it. You can see that uh, it puts in their name. And it says that Jim True added you as a signer to the add name uh, documents. And that's where the title of the uh, uh, package is, as well as whatever uh, message you have in there. Please sign and review. Very simple. They click the big button. takes them into the uh, uh, e-sign process. First thing they do is they acknowledge that they're signing a uh, document as a, an electronic signature. And then it's presenting the document. Um, they can review the document. And there's a little uh, uh, yellow sticky indicating where they want them to uh, sign. And so I can just simply click the sign. Acknowledge that I clicked it, and refresh the document. And notice it automatically populated in Sally's name and the day that she signed it. Let's jump over to Tom and see if Tom's got any email. Here's a new signed document for Tom. Tom goes through the same process. Notice I'm using a different browser between Tom and Sally to, to make this uh, quick. And uh, they, they, they will present it slightly differently, but they're basically working the same. Notice you can see that Sally assigned it. And it's marking for me to sign over here as Tom.
and the document is signed. At this point, when the document is, is collected all signatures, they can download the document, uh, or if they miss that, um, uh, they're, they're going to get another email saying that uh, um, uh, is it signed and available for download. So the users are notified when the item is uh, completed the signing process. Now let's go back to safe. Close that trace. Do a refresh. And you can see that now it's indicating the item is in workflow because it's been returned and checked back into safe. I can do a trace. And I, I've got a history of the whole process of who I sent it to, that the package was completed, um, the, the note that was put on it as it went in the workflow, and it went into my workflow. So uh, it's a good way of uh, uh, knowing an item has been uh, completed and, and it can continue on in the process that that uh, uh, action needs to take place. Uh, Jim True, in this case, also would receive an email saying that a, uh, the document has been signed. So you know they don't have to be watching safe to see if it's come in. They, they can just be watching their email and they know that a document has been uh, signed. Let me go through another example. Um, let's say you have a uh, situation where you've got a word merge document. And uh, this is a little demo proposal I have here. And you know there's some things that are just a little better suited for Word than a, a PDF form. And I got an example of, of how we have that going here. Um, I'm using Word Merge, so again, I'm pulling into the company name. And in this case, I have an embedded Excel file. Okay, sometimes uh, doing Excel activities in a PDF can be a little tricky. So Word might be the, the preferred uh, document type. So let me go ahead and fill in a couple of numbers so I can order some widgets. Okay, and it automatically updates that. Everything looks good there. You notice this document doesn't have any signatures. Okay, so let me go ahead and close that. Okay, so there it is on my preview. Now what I want to do is I want to send it out for a signature. I go through the same process we just went through. But now uh, eSign detects this document does not have any signatures. And when it detects that, it'll present me with the options that the system administrator has set up for the signing pages. Uh, I have two examples here, one with one signature, one with two signatures. I'm going to uh, select the one signature. Now what eSign is going to do is it's going to take that Word document, convert it into a PDF, and append a signature page. It's going to file the PDF and take the original document that I created it from and, and make that a child document. Okay. Let's see. Let me also do one more thing. Let's say at this point I wanted to include this case study. I can drag that over. Now I've got a case study and a uh, uh, proposal. Send that off to eSign. Again, I can change these as I see fit. Um, that I only selected one signature, so let me go ahead and make Sally the signer for that. Okay, click Next. And here's a screen that didn't show up in my last example, because my first example, I only had one document. In this one, I have two documents. And you can see here that I have the, uh, the proposal, which is a, uh, a signature document, and the case study, which is what we call a review document, which means it's part of the package, but no signature is required for it. At this point, uh, it gives me the option of, of controlling the order that I want to present those to the uh, uh, person signing off on the documents. And again, I'm, I'm not going to have workflow this time. Okay, so let me go ahead and send that. Okay, the item has been sent. Now, let me take you through one more thing. Let's say any one of the signers or the person who sent it decided, whoops, wait a minute, I've got a mistake on that. I have to uh, you know, send out a new copy of that that's been corrected. I want to cancel this signing uh, process. Um, 
they're, they're, for the uh, uh, person doing the signing, at the top of their screen, they're going to have an option that says decline. As soon as they click this decline, it'll say, you know, please enter a reason for declining. And they enter their reason, and that'll, that'll be captured by uh, uh, SAFE. But uh, just do it real quickly. I'm going to do it here and exercise this, which has the same effect. Okay, and it's telling me that all these documents are part of the package. And you can put whatever you want in there as far as your message that you want to. Hit confirm. And it'll remove the item from uh, eSign. Let me go ahead and uh, click trace. And you can see that uh, eSign sent it out to uh, Sally and that um, uh, it was canceled as a uh, uh, canceled demo was the message that was put in there and Jim True did the activity. If it was one of the signers who canceled it, their name would also appear in there as to indicate who was the person who uh, you know, uh, canceled the uh, signing process. So there you have it. There's the demo of eSign. And uh, Gene, I guess I'll hand it back